Yeah. Okay, Dr. Martinez, or should I call you Diana? You can call me Diana, that's fine. Okay, Diana, uh, the last time I saw you, I was tripping on ketamine. <laughs> True. Um, <laughs> research study was all for science. I, I Yeah, it was, and, and then three days later, I noticed a distinct drop in the noise in my left ear of the tinnitus. And, and first of all, let's get up our, our, our term straight at the very beginning, tinnitus or tinnitus? It, it's really either one. You can use either one. Okay. So, so I, I, um, I answered an ad that you guys put in uh, on an Instagram and I saw it sort of, you know, going by and it said, do you have tinnitus? Would you like to try treatment with ketamine? And I thought, I know a friend who's had extreme help via ketamine for depression. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard of ketamine as treatment for tinnitus, but this is something you've, you've started studying. And I don't know anyone else is doing this right now. So what, what was the sort of flash moment that you thought, oh, I should try this? And how have you gone about creating your um, study and tell me, tell me the whys and where's and how's and what and, and all the, all the answers. Sure. So it really started, it was quite some number of years ago, maybe even 10 years now. I was, I had flown to San Francisco and Hawaii for work for conferences and foolishly stayed like one night in each place and then turned around and flew back. I had little kids. Yeah. And as I landed near York airport, I had the typical tons of pain in my ear followed by a relief. And I knew right away, I was like, oh, I ruptured an eardrum. Yeah. Um, and and, and, you know, it, it didn't hurt right away. You know, it didn't really strike me right away. But soon later that day, I noticed that I had a loss of hearing in my ear and extreme tinnitus. It was it was like trying to sleep in the subway station. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I kind of knew what it was. I mean, I'd gone, I'm a psychiatrist, but I, you know, I didn't really focus on it for many years. I went to see an ENT doctor and I had an ear infection. She gave me antibiotics, but, you know, the tinnitus was really quite miserable really, really, really disturbing. And so I did a bunch of research on it as fast as I could. I went back to her and said, you know, I want steroids because I know steroids sometimes help if you do it right away. And her reaction was, well, it's not a good idea when you have an infection. And my response was, I don't care. I can't live this way. Right. I took steroids. I was very lucky. The tinnitus got much better. I still have a little bit of it, but it's, it's remarkably better. Um, I do research and addiction. That's mostly what I do. You know, I came back to the lab and I told everybody who works in my lab, I'm like, forget addiction. We're studying tinnitus. <laughs> oh, interesting. Got it. Yes. <laughs> that was a while ago. But, you know, I kept reading up on it and reading up on it. I was always very interested in it. There was not really a lot of funding for it, at least in terms of NIH funding. And then I saw that the Department of Defense was really interested in it. So I started researching tinnitus. I was really actually interested in trying to develop a device. I sort of had this idea that maybe a device would work. But the more I read about it, it was really, you know, the, the neuropharmacology of it made sense. It really was about NMDA receptor antagonism and GABA levels and GABA levels in the brain. And um, as I started reading it, I was like, well, this is ketamine. Like we already have a, a medication that can accomplish what all the neuroscience was saying, mostly research done in rodents. And from there, I wrote a grant to the Department of Defense. Honestly, when I submitted it, I thought they were going to be like, what is a psychiatrist doing studying tinnitus and why do psychiatrists think ketamine cures everything and that they would sort of throw my grant out, but they didn't, they were actually very interested. So the study is now funded by the department of defense. And the reason that they are interested is because they probably have a lot of soldiers back from the field with tinnitus because of, I mean, I think, I, I don't know where my tinnitus started, but I definitely had a loud explosion in Afghanistan in 1989. I had a girl scream into my ear when I was five years old. I had, a uh, um, I went deaf from COVID. So I have all the reasons that you could possibly go, but I noticed, and I told you this when I first met you, I noticed the tinnitus right after my my second um, shot. Oh no, no, it was the first shot, my first um, COVID shot. Mm -hmm. And have you seen other of your of the people in this uh, study with um, COVID shot related tinnitus? No, I've read about it. We haven't had anybody with tinnitus from the vaccine. We've had a couple of people who had tinnitus and then with got COVID oh. and it was much worse. So we've had that. I haven't seen anyone with vaccine related, but uh, other than yourself, but, um, but a lot of people with COVID. 
Yeah. I mean, who knows? Because I did have COVID in March of 2020 as well. And I had long COVID for a long time. It could all be part and parcel. I mean, who knows why I had it? But I did notice in March of 2021, which is when it really started in earnest. Mm -hmm. And, and I have to say that the one infusion of ketamine really worked for, I mean, it didn't, it didn't work right away, but after three days, I noticed a drastic drop in the set in the, in the um, volume of the tinnitus, but now it's creeping back up again. So I'm wondering like how many, like if you were to do this for real, once you finish your studies, mm-hmm. how many infusions would be sort of the norm, like six to eight or something like that? Well, I mean, that's a good question. And we're really sort of following the depression literature when it mm-hmm. comes to ketamine. So the first days with depression, which are about 20 years old now, you know, they did one dose of ketamine and they saw that there was an improvement seven to 10 days. Mm-hmm. And so then they repeated it. And now we're sort of been asking the question, well, how often do you have to repeat ketamine? How long does it last? And, and the answer is it varies a lot across different people. Um, and so I don't think we have, you know, like some people like will come back for ketamine if you twice a month. And some people are fine for five, six months. Like we just don't, we just don't have a good answer. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm glad to hear about your response to our study. Like, I don't know the answers yet because we haven't broken the blind because we don't do that until we're completely done. Um, but we are, we, we have been thinking of our next study that we want to do with ketamine, um, hoping to start maybe in the summer or the fall. This will not be an imaging study. You did the hardcore study where you're in the scanner for 90 minutes because that's an imaging study. We're looking at goblet levels in the brain. Um, The next study that we're going to do is actually going to be outpatient and we're trying to use mindfulness. So we're going to have mindfulness training uh, for a period of time uh, for people have tinnitus because there are studies showing that mindfulness training helps. Mm-hmm. And then we will um, have a ketamine infusion and then continue mindfulness training. And our hope is that if we, if, if we invest in mindfulness training, the idea of being that ketamine can make it more effective, right. that we can get away with one dose of ketamine, maybe one dose entirely, right. or maybe one dose every few months. Right rather than having to repeat a cycle of regular ketamine infusions in order to keep it at bay. Well, first of all, sign me up. I would like to (laughs) sign up for the mindfulness and the ketamine infusion. Because actually one of the things I noticed about being on ketamine in a tube was that I really wanted to explore what was going on or just sort of be free. And you're just flying like this with your head. So, Mm -hmm. um, but there were some funny moments uh, (laughs) after I came back. So the just for everybody that's listening here, I they showed you a video in the in the MRI and one of the objects in the video were two swans. So those two swans kept appearing and then it just got too bright and I couldn't look at it anymore because my eye, I guess my pupils were too big. But um, when I came home, uh, my boyfriend had put some strawberries on the table and I was I picked up a strawberry and I said something like, imagine a world where there's strawberries and swans. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, really kind of the, the effects of it long lasting, but short lasting, meaning by the end of the evening, it was done, but I really, I cannot believe how quickly the tinnitus went away after three days. I mean, n- not down to zero, but nearly so. Mm-hmm. And I want to live that way again. Um, I just, I, I'm always finding myself in a position where the science is not caught up to my body. Like I was dealing with um, menopausal issues before, you know, we were talking to women about estrogen or, or, or giving women estrogen. And I just feel like constantly that these ailments that I'm experiencing are not being treated by the science. So how fast can you do this so that it be, can become the, the choice in, in therapy? Well, that's a good question. So the study that you participated in has been going on for four years. This is what it takes when you do, it's, yeah. it's a it's a well-controlled study. It's very tightly controlled. And actually our main outcome measure in the study that you did is not whether or not your tinnitus got better. Our main outcome measure is whether or not we changed GABA levels in the brain. Did you and change GABA levels in my brain? We don't know. We, yeah. we like it's analyzed, but we haven't broke, we haven't divided it into the different groups yet. So I don't know the answer yet. Right. And until the study's all done, I, I can't look at the results. Right. right. And and the reason for that is because I mean you're right, like tinnitus is mostly caused by hearing loss. 
Uh, for whatever reason, the nerves in the ear that are in charge of high frequency hearing are very sensitive to injury and those tend to be lost early. So most people, most middle-aged people all have high frequency hearing loss. And what happens, what's interesting with tinnitus is that it seems to be that the brain is filling in that sound. So it's oh. like a phantom, right? It's like you used to hear this sound, now you don't, and your brain is filling it in. Um, so it's not really an ear problem, it's an auditory cortex problem, the part of the brain that's processing sound. And there's a previous study from some time ago that showed that people who have tinnitus have low levels of GABA in the auditory cortex, and other studies show that you can increase it with ketamine. So that's why we're, that's the reasoning behind our study. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's sort of very tightly controlled. You, as you know, there's a saline control, then there's the, the ketamine control. We have you in the scanner a long time because we actually scan before and after. Uh, we're trying to do it as tightly as possible. Now, independent of those results, I would like to move you know, this research along further. The, the mindfulness study that we're thinking of will not be as tightly controlled. Um, partly because it's not funded yet. So we're, <laughs> we have to figure that into it. And, and also I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be aware of the fact that we don't always need the tightest controls on things in order to, to move them into the clinic. Right. You know, sometimes, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And I think there's a role for very tightly controlled studies, but there's also a role for studies that can just sort of change clinical practice more rapidly. And that's how we became interested in sort of the mindfulness effect, because there are studies showing that mindfulness can reduce tinnitus. There are studies showing that ketamine plus mindfulness can have benefits for other disorders, not tinnitus. Right. So we're sort of putting it all together. We're taking sort of well-established studies and sort of trying to put them together. And ultimately, as I mentioned, our goal is to not have, you could, and as you probably know, like ketamine isn't generally covered by insurance or there's, yeah. right. And it can be sort of expensive. So if we can have a system where, you know, where we can reduce the need for ketamine and, and improve the efficacy of mindfulness. And that would be our goal. And do you need more people for your study right now for the one that we, where you go into the MRI? Um, frankly, we need a couple more women. Okay. Uh, we, we, I, I, th that's mostly who's looking at my <laughs> subsect. So that's great. Yeah. We, we were, we're, we've been behind in recruiting women. Mm -hmm. um, our, our, when we first started the study, we had this cohort that was almost all male practically all musicians, all of whom are willing to go into a scanner for 90 minutes and, and have ketamine. Um, one of the main reasons we haven't enrolled more women is that when they screen with us, they don't want to do the scanning part, which is Why? not, you know, most people want a straightforward clinical trial and that's just not what we're offering right now. Right. Some people have claustrophobia, some people have metal in their bodies. And so, right. you know, that, that, so the, some people have, you know, reasons to not be in a scanner. Right. I found the scanner to be completely fine. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a long time in there, but it's no big deal. It's just, and I'm kind of, I'm also interested in the brain scans and the, and the GABA. So when, as soon as you have those results, I would love to know um, the amount of GABA. So can we define our terms for a second? You spoke very quickly and very um, clinically about terms that I don't understand. You said MNMA, what did you say? What were the words? NMDA, you? NMDA receptor. M, say it. NMDA. NMDA. What is that? So the NMDA receptor in, in the brain, there are two major neurotransmitter systems. So we talk about neurotransmitters. Most people have heard of dopamine. Most people have heard of serotonin. Those are actually kind of more minor neurotransmitter systems, which means that they kind of just tweak different cognitive processes, different thought processes in the brain. The major neurotransmitters are called GABA and glutamate. They're kind of, you can think of them as being like the the gas pedal and a brake on a car. These, these are really the ones that make the brain run and slow down. Okay. So for example, if you have too much GABA, people fall asleep. If you have too much glutamate, people will have a seizure, right? These, these, these are major neurotransmitters. And alcohol, for example, lowers GABA. Increases GABA. Increases GABA. Oh, and so it increases GABA. So that makes you fall asleep. Right. Okay. And then if you have a, if you stop drinking, you can get a rebound effect, but that's right. another that's well, that's why I stopped drinking because I would be waking up in the middle of the night from that rebound oh. effect at two in the morning. So I stopped drinking wine and now I sleep through the night. So those, that's GABA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what ketamine does 
is it blocks the NMDA receptor, which is part of the glutamate system, but not to a degree to where you cause a significant change in consciousness. I know, I know it sounds like it was a big change of consciousness, but you know, we can't have big effects on GABA and glutamate without having big effects on the person's brain. Mm -hmm. Right. And so our thinking between the NMDA receptor is that it has a role in plasticity. And so plasticity, meaning that, you know, we, our, our brains are what we call as neuroscientists, very plastic early in life, meaning that that's why you can learn another language. Or that's where you can learn to ride a bicycle. And that's why it gets harder as you get older in life, because that plasticity goes away. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you know, your brain sort of having habits makes you more efficient, right? So you don't have to even think about riding a bicycle when you're riding a bicycle, right? Your brain just sort of goes on autopilot. But that autopilot can have problematic effects. And we think that's what's going on with, with ketamine. I mean, with tinnitus, it's just sort of in this autopilot mode. And we're trying to um, undo that. Sort of kick it out of its, out of its, out of its habits, essentially. Right. And, right. and I also want to say that though I said I was tripping on ketamine, it was an incredibly pleasant experience. I found nothing but pleasure in it and kind of an openness. And there's actually one moment I didn't tell you about when I was in that tube where you think about your own death. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's one of the things that you think about. And, and I was like, oh, that would happen. If that happened, I'd be okay with that. Like that's a huge leap forward in in a person's life in middle age to be able to just say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to die one day. All right. That's, that's, what's going to happen. And I was completely at ease with that thought when it came to me in that tube, because of course you're in this tube, you're thinking about being in a coffin, right? Like right. that's what it's going to feel like or not because you're going to be dead. But um, mm -hmm. it was a fascinating experience. And, you know, I guess I would urge women who are have tinnitus and are watching this like to, to join the study if you're in New York, because um, mm -hmm. how else are we going to move science forward, but by using our own bodies to, to do that. Right. And also Diana's awesome. So it was fun working with you. Um, but what else, can, can we talk a little bit more about GABA? What is GABA? I don't really understand what it is. So not as neuroscientists, to be honest with you, we don't either. I mean, okay. we, know what it does, we know what it does on a global picture, right? So like, for example, if somebody has a seizure, you increase GABA, that stops the seizure, right? We, we know that alcohol increases GABA. We know that certain medications like gabapentin can increase GABA, which might help for its pain. Mm -hmm. So, and the, these are big global effects that we have on the brain. Really, you know, what GABA is doing is it's, it's increasing and decreasing all across the brain in small areas as a per, like, for example, you know, just, just moving your arm, right? Like you have to activate some brain regions and deactivate others. And so GABA and glutamate work in concert to do practically every brain process that we oh. do, right? And, and so, yeah, that that's, I think the best definition that I can come up with. Um, and that's why like when we're doing something like, like ketamine, which has big effects on GABA and glutamate, we do it for short periods of time, right? And yeah. because you can't walk around on ketamine for all the time, yeah. <laughs> all the time, right? <laughs> and actually, you know, your experience in the scanner sort of has sort of led us to the, the mindfulness study because, you know, some people come out of the scanner and, and I can tell you most of the people who've come out of the scanner have, have sort of not as profound an experience as you're describing, but similar mm -hmm. where you know, in the beginning you, you're in this tube, it feels like the international space station, you know, you're in this tube, nobody's there. There's no sound. You can't hear anything, which is always a freaky experience. And you can either freak out or you can sort of have conversations with yourself. Yeah. And, I had a lot. You know, and we, we try and have people ready for that. You know, mm -hmm. when they go into the scanner, like I think you you are ready to go, but we have, sometimes we have people in the scanner where in the study and they're less sure. And we really have long conversations about whether or not this is a good idea. Cause we don't want anyone to be upset in the scanner. Right. And well, we so I've had, I mean, I've had so many scans just because of things that have gone wrong in my body and migraines and, you know, some I'm used to being in the scans for a long time and it was not as noisy as it usually is. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is I do have a yoga practice and a meditation practice. So I'm good at just kind of letting go. So I do think that mindfulness plus ketamine is not a bad idea as your second um, portion of your study. One question I have is, for example, I've noticed that there are ketamine infusion um, uh, offices popping up around New York City. Um, 
if I went to them, what would be the dosage of ketamine I would ask for? Very good question. There's a lot of variability in what people offer in different clinics. Mm -hmm. The dose that we use is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if you look up my, if you look up Diana Martinez, Columbia, it'll pull up our website and I, yeah. the, the lab website, you can contact me there. And I think we listed it there. And okay. we use that dose because it is uh, the most commonly researched dose when it comes to depression. There have been some other doses. It is also the dose that we know changes GABA levels in the brain in depression. So okay. that's why we chose that specific dose. Um, so 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. So you can estimate how much that would be weight-based. And we infuse it over 40 minutes, which is also borrowed from the depression studies. And, um, it, but it can be, it could be infused slower. Got it. Okay. So you did it pretty fast to me. Essentially. You did it pretty fast. We, we use the fast route. Yeah. Um, and then I guess my last question I would have is, um, how is your own tinnitus? How is it going now? Like how many infusions of ketamine did you have? And how is your tinnitus from that moment when you had it? Um, I did not have, I took steroids way back when. Oh, okay. I took steroids right when it happened. So oh. if you take steroids right away, like in my case, it was like, I went from nothing to a hundred percent. So steroids work if you take it right away in that case, if it's a more subtle onset, it doesn't really tend, tend to work that well. Um, so I personally have never tried ketamine. Oh, um, okay. My tennis now is, you know, is, is, is pretty, it's okay. I experiment with myself sometimes. So for example, I know that if I drink alcohol, it's better that night and worse the next morning. So right. <laughs> um, I also have been experimenting with myself with mindfulness because this, believe me, I'm a neuroscientist. Mindfulness has never been my thing. Right. Um, but so I've, I've been trying out different apps, free apps to see if any of these help me. And, and, you know, we, we have a debate. I'm, I'm working with two other people who know a lot more about mindfulness than I, and we have this debate as to whether or not our mindfulness should be like silence where you focus on the tinnitus and try and make it you know less your enemy mm -hmm. or whether it should be like, I've also been using Gregorian chant. I find Gregorian chant very helpful for drowning out the tinnitus and um, or whether we should have mindfulness plus another sound because I find personally with my own tinnitus, when, when it's really annoying me, which is usually in the morning. So I wake up, but Gregorian chant takes it right out. It just makes it go down very, very, very nicely. Oh, um, you know, when I was, I was um, ha dealing with COVID in March of 2020 and I really couldn't breathe and I was really scared because I couldn't get a breath. I had turned on um, in Nepal, I'd had a sound bath therapy mm -hmm. and there are just these bowls that they hit with gongs. Mm -hmm. And I found that actually the most relaxing mm -hmm. sound. And I played it for three hours and made it through the night, you know, but I was just like the panic and the inability to breathe at the same time was kind of like, right. you know, it was just, it, I couldn't, it wouldn't work. You know, I had to find some way. So those gongs might not be a bad idea either. So we, we I've, I've tried the gong that we're talking about the bowls, right? The Tibetan bowls. Yeah. Yeah. I find the, I think it's just me. Like I find the bowls kind of I don't like them very much. Like, I kind of <laughs> like really low frequency sounds. Right. Yeah. I found that focusing on low frequency sounds more helpful. So if tinnitus is really bothering me, like I'll try and focus on distant traffic or something to right. sort of like switch my focus away from the tinnitus. Right. Um, but but the two people I'm working with, they they're big fans of the singing bowl. So yeah. I think well, you can do the singing bowls and just make sure that they have the low frequency sound. Low frequency. The bigger yeah. bowls are lower. Got it. I'll yeah. have to try the bigger bowls. I think I yes. like the, the tingy bowls. And no, I don't like, I don't like any, by the way, with my tinnitus, I hate any like, right. and the problem is because I went deaf from COVID, I have these hearing aids. So everything is at a frequency that sounds like an AM radio, Yep, everything. And it's really, really annoying. Like music doesn't sound good. People's voices. I can't tell if a beep is coming from inside the house. So like, is it my dishwasher or is it like a car backing up? I don't know the difference because it's just sound. It's flat sound in my ear. I, I agree. Like why do dishwashers have in cars? Why do they have these high beeps? Oh Try God, a awful. low beep. Like why? I feel like, you know, the, the people who like high beeps are annoying the rest of us. Totally. And my stove 
like with the tinnitus, my stove, if you turn it on, it spends about two minutes with this really high frequency sound to let you know that they've turned the stove on. Like, turn it on. Tell oh, me. Like, have, a, have somebody talk to me. Please have a voice. voice. Your yeah. stove is like, on. <laughs> like a Siri, your stove is on. <laughs> yeah. Why can't that be the way? Well, anyway, Diana, thank you so much for talking with me. I'm going to write this up. Um, and I'll probably have some more questions, but this is great because otherwise I, I wouldn't be able, able to explain really well what you've said to me. So I'm glad to have this video. I'm going to press stop and then okay. stay on and I'll talk to you afterwards. Hold mm -hmm. on one second. Mm -hmm.